Today is the, so the first part of a two-part lecture series we're doing on um, join algorithms. So today we're going to do hash joins because they're the, the, the primary ones and the support ones. And then on, uh, on Monday next week, then we'll be doing uh, sort merge joins, which are important to have, but not, uh, almost always you want to use a hash join. And we'll sort of see why. All right, so the background today is some high-level ideas about uh, doing parallel joins. Right, so now, unlike in the introduction class where we said here's just the algorithm, and the, we really just cared about minimizing disk I/O. Now, since everything's memory, we need to worry about you know how, how to take advantage of all the CPU cores and 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 the parallelism that we have. So then we'll talk about how to do a parallel hash join, and this will sort of be broken down into the three phases of doing the uh, hash join. And then within the build phase, we'll talk about hash functions and hashing schemes. And then we'll finish off with uh, an evaluation that actually predates the one that you guys read, um, but it still, in my opinion, it still illustrates the, the, the core ideas. So as I said, that in the introduction class uh, last semester, we told you join algorithms, but we just said, hey, look, we care about minimizing the number of blocks read and written from disk. And then we made decisions about you know, what should be the outer table versus the inner table, uh, sort of in real, real simplistically. But now uh, we need to think about how we actually want to speed things up and take advantage of all the hardware that's available to us. So the two main approaches we want to use to have a high performance join algorithm is either the hash join or the submerge join. Right? So there really is no other technique to, to do. Right? You either sort things or you hash them, um, or you just do like a, the brute force nested loop join. So, for, the, for this class, we're not going to talk about nested loop joins at all um, because it's simply not going to be, uh, almost always is never going to be a good choice for the kind of OLAP queries we've been talking about, like doing large scans and complex analytics or doing multi-way joins or you know, joining multiple tables within a single query. The, the nested loop join primarily only shows up in OLGP environments. And some OLGP database systems actually don't even implement a hash join because they don't need it, because most of the times the queries that they're focused on are going to be doing index nested loop joins. So you, you iterate over the, um, the outer table, you, know, you find the, the tuples you want to join for the outer table, and then you have an index to probe into the inner table and find the few number of tuples that you need. So think of an example of like, I want to log into my Amazon account and I want to list all my orders, so you do a, a join between Andy's orders and the items Andy bought in those orders. So there's going to be an index on the order ID in the, or, in the order item table, so I know how to jump into just get those, uh, those tuples I need. I'm not doing any long scans. Um, at a high level, when you think about it, though, what the hash join is actually going to do, it's essentially building an index on the fly. Right? The hash table is, is, essentially this, is going to be our index, but unlike in the OTP environment where we have the index available to do queries very quickly, in a hash join, we're going to build the index do our, do our computation, do our join, and then throw, throw it away. Right? We're not keeping it around. We're not maintaining it for uh, you know, beyond the query that we're executing. Some, there's some systems that can do that, but that's not our focus here. The other thing to think about, too, is like in the LHB environment, I, you know, I may want to do range queries on my index. So that's why chances are this is going to be a, like a B plus tree or some kind of tree data structure that we talked about. In the hash join, we don't care about range queries. We're doing point queries, so we want that O1 lookup that the hash table is going to give us to find the one tuple that's going to have what, what we need. Now, depending on our hash table implementation, we may have to scan a little bit if we have collisions. But again, the, the, the high-level semantics of what the query wants to do on our hash index or hash table is, is not doing range queries. So that's why, that's why we don't want to use a B plus tree. Um, but again, the, at a high level, this is essentially doing the same thing. So the the debate between whether you want to use a hash join versus a sort merge join is sort of one of these classic things in, 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 this, in the field of databases, right? And every decade, it goes back and forth which one's actually the best. So in the 1970s, uh, it was the conventional wisdom that the sort merge algorithm was better because people didn't know how to do hash joins or hash, build hash tables for, uh, for, for tables that exceed the size of memory that was available. So you figure, we know how to do external merge sort. Let me just sort everything, and then I'll walk through and do, and do my join that way. Then in the 1980s, people realized, oh, hashing is actually important. Hash joins could be better. So there was this movement in these database. They were called database machines. Think of like as being specialized hardware explicitly to run database systems. 
And then they added additional features in the actual CPUs or the instruction set for these specialized hardware that do uh, hashing very efficiently. Now we have some things like that in Intel chips, but these are like, think of like customized hardware that was just to run the database system and they had hash join implementations on hardware. These sort of went out of vogue uh, because of, you know, sort of, sort of engineering costs and actually just, you know, uh, by the time you, you spec'd out and fabbed your own database machine, Intel came out with a newer version of their chip and that already surpassed what you could do. So people don't really build specialized hardware anymore, although that's slowly coming back into vogue today. Um, in the 1990s, Gertz Graffy, the guy that did the Volcano uh, work um, and the indexing, index locking paper that you guys read, he had a paper that said, well, if you kind of squint at a, at a high level and look at today's, today's hardware, sort merge join and hash join are essentially equivalent. They'll get the same performance for the same, roughly the, the same workloads. Then, though, since in the 2000s, hashing, hash joins really took off. And now this is, again, where we're at today is hash joins considered the, the, the correct way to go if you want a high performance uh, join algorithm. Now, if your data is already sorted and, you're, and don't, it's already sorted on your join key, clearly sort merge join is going to be better. But if it's unsorted and you don't, don't know anything about it, then, uh, then hashing is the way to go. And then where we're at now and today in this decade, although it's almost over, is that the debate is either when you want to do partitioned or non-partition hash joins, right? And then in 2020s, in, in you know, Donald Trump's third administration or whatever, uh, we'll see what actually turns out, right? And again, we, we, we might all be dead. That's okay. All right. So I want to talk about, look, again, give a little more detail of the last decade worth of work on parallel join algorithms for MMB databases. So as I said, there was this back and forth where the hash join versus sort merge join was better. Um, there was a paper came out in 2009 by Intel, um, working, actually Intel and Oracle together, where they said that hashing is clearly better than sort merge join, so that's the, what you want to do in your, in your database system. Uh, but they also proposed that if you had wider SIMD registers, um, specifically 512-bit registers, then sort merge join would actually be uh, preferential, would actually would be better. Now, at the time, 512-bit registers didn't exist. They actually exist now, as of like two years ago. But I don't think anybody's actually done, uh, you know, has, has sort of revisited this claim. Um, again, we'll cover, we'll cover SIMD in more detail in, 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 in two more lectures, and we'll cover sort merge join uh, next class, right? But, but again, but, but in 2009, given what the hardware was available at the time, they said hashing was better. And then in 2011, we'll show some of these results later on, but they sort of actually measured the trade-off between partition versus non-partition uh, hash joins. Um, then in 2012, the hyper guys in Germany, they came out and said, well, Intel was wrong, Wisconsin was wrong, sort merge join is actually better, even if you don't have the newer hardware that Intel says you need, uh, we can actually make sort merge join work, work faster than hash joins right now. Right? So that was 2012. Then 2013 said, ignore what the hyper guys said, ignore what we said. Um, and you actually really, you really want to do hashing, right? Um, so then they have a hash algorithm that, that uh, I forget whether this was partitioned. I think it was partitioned. Um, again, so they said hashing was better. Then in, uh, in 2013, uh, the people in Switzerland, ATH, they came up with a new, um, new optimizations to make the radix hash join or a partition hash join. Right? We'll, we're going to do a Radix, Radix based partitioning hash join, and we'll cover what that is uh, in a few more slides. So they just said, here's how to make the hash join even better. Um, and clearly, you want to do partitioned. And the paper I had you, had you guys read was in 2016, where more Germans basically said, hold up, everyone is, is sort of not thinking this through clearly. Everyone's sort of proposing their own simple optimizations for like how to tweak this one thing to make it go better. And they actually try to then provide an exhaustive evaluation of all the different design decisions you have. In, in your hash join, um, and they basically show that under different conditions, one actually might be better than another. Right? So that's sort of what we're at today. Hash join is, is considered the fastest way to do this. The exact details of, of how to get the best performance uh, can vary depending on the workload. So although this system sort of gives you a um, sort of a, a recipe guide or a bunch of different different ways to implement your hash joins. Uh, Nobody actually, as far as I know, most systems don't actually say, here's all, you know, let's try to implement every different case that these guys support. Everyone pretty much picks up, you know, picks one way and just makes that work really well. So you either pick partitioned or non-partitioned. As far as I know, everyone does non-partitioned. 
and you don't worry about you know doing anything dynamic or adaptive based on what they're doing here. All right. All right. So what are our goals when we want to design a joint algorithm? So again, in a in a disk-based system, it's all about disk I/O. So it's all about removing the amount of data we have to read and write uh, as we do the join. In our world, it's a little more different. So the first goal is that we want to minimize synchronization, right? So we don't want to have the different threads taking latches on shared data structures and have them interfering with other threads maybe computing the join at the same time, right? We want to try to make this uh, uh, sort of non-blocking as much as possible. Now, that's not to say we want to make this latch-free, because uh, we, as we talked about before, making things latch-free does, does cause you to have, you know, do extra work in order to, to be able to say that you're latch free. But there's other ways to organize the data in such, in such a way that we can then still remove the amount of synchronization that we have to do. We're also going to want to minimize the, uh, the, the number of CPU cache misses, right? We talked about this before. We talked about that, the, you know, this, the difference between going and getting something in your cache versus going and getting something out in memory is, is quite significant. So we want to design our algorithm in such a way that they're reusing data while it exists in the CPU cache as much as possible. So you don't do sort of random jumps to different spots and go every time is a, is a different cache miss. You want to maybe try to have some locality in, in affinity in, in the data that you're accessing. And certainly also, too, uh, since we, we, we want to run in a NUMA environment, we want to avoid the amount of uh, traffic we have going over the, you know, going over the socket. All right, so sort of this is what I sort of already said. Like, how can we? Nope. Nope. Okay, sorry. All right. All right, so how, how, can we, how can we improve our cache behavior? So again, what's going to cause us to have cache misses? Well, certainly there's the size of, of the CPU cache. Right? This is L1, L2, L3. Um, and it also depends on what's in our TLB, the trans trans translation look aside buffer. So if we, again, we're jumping around in different spots in memory, and every single time is, is, a, is a new cache miss because the data we need is not there, then it also could be we're gonna have a TLB miss because the, 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 the mapping from the virtual address to the physical address for what we're trying to access is not in our TLB. So that's another cache miss for, for the, the hardware actually to go fetch that for us. So the way we can, again, architect the system is that we want to then um, maximize the amount of sequential access we're doing. Right? So we don't want to do random, random jumps into, to, to, into, into our data. We want to do long scans as much as possible so that we can have everything sort of fit in a cache line, operate on all the data that we bring into our, you know, into our CPU cache within that cache line, and then be done with it before we move on to the next one. The other one is that if, in the case we do have to do random lookups, we want to have the search space of what a thread or core is going to look at fit in our, in our local cache, right? Because if, if, if we're jumping out to different sockets, again, that sucks. But if we're jumping out to data that's beyond our CPU caches, that's still bad too. So again, we, we, there's, there's, these are the things we sort of be, we need to be mindful as we are, as, as we are you know, designing our algorithms. Now, what end up happening is the way you, like for this one here, um, you know, you would seem, all right, clearly I want to do partitioning. This, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to want to do, right, to, to, in order to take advantage of this. Again, this is trade-off between the, the, the number of instructions versus the amount of memory I have to use. And it actually is going to turn out to be the case where, uh, at least a modern CPU, that partitioning is actually not going to help us. Right? Because we're going to end up doing, you know, multiple passes over the data in order to partition it. And that ends up being uh, more work than just paying the penalty to have cache misses. But we can still design other aspects of the system, or, or, or of our algorithm, to be mindful of this. All right, so hash joins. So hash join is the most important operator in, uh, in a data management system for our lab workloads. It, uh, it usually rises up to be near the top of what the, at least for an in-memory database, what the, the bulk of the majority of the time that the database is, is spending doing work, is doing these joins. Um, the, you know, filtering we can we can speed up with vectorization. Uh, sorting we can speed up with other, other techniques. But the hash join is sort of like this brute force thing we have to like just just do. And so there's there's things we can do to make it suck less, but it's still going to be the the high pull in the tent. And that's why we're going to spend you know entire day talking about how to make make it go faster. So 
in the in, in the interclass, we just when we talk about the hash join, we don't even discuss in terms of what of hardware like cores or threads and things like that. Where you say, here's the algorithm, and we just assume that it's going to go do it. But now we need to design our implementation of our hash join algorithm to be aware that we're going to run in parallel multiple cores and how to uh, how to make sure that 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 they're running at full speed or with full utilization, but don't become bound or bound by the bottleneck of, of getting things off the, the memory, right? So a hash join can be broken up into three phases, or is broken up into three phases. So the first one, we, we can do partitioning, and this is optional. And this is what we'll take all the tuples that we want to partition, or sorry, we want to join on the, the outer table R and the inner table S, and we're going to split them up into the join key uh, using the hash function that we we're going to join on anyway. And sort of dividing up them to smaller chunks so that when we do now our, our join, right, that we're only looking at data within two corresponding chunks from, from the outer and the inner. And this is also called the great hash join. I think we covered it in the intro class. All right, so again, regardless now if we've done the partitioning or not, in the second phase, is that it will actually now build the hash table for the outer table R based on our join key. So this means that we're scanning R. And we're looking at the join attribute, and then we're going to hash it and put it into some hash table. We'll describe what that hashing function is or what that hash table looks like in a second. Then now once we build our hash, hash function, or sorry, a hash table, then in the probe phase, we then scan through the inner table S. We look at its join key, hash it, and do a lookup in, into the hash table we just built in the previous phase. And then we find a match, then we, we, we splice the two tuples together and then produce that as our output. So one of the things that the paper you guys read that I like is like they're actually doing the they're actually doing this materialization step. Some of the other papers actually don't do this. They just say, all right, I, like I do my match, I find my join, I find that the join keys match, and then they just throw the result away, um, which is not realistic. In a real system, you actually need to produce the output. So in the paper you guys read from the Sarlin uh, researchers, they actually do this full step. Now it seems kind of trivial, like why wouldn't you just always do this? Uh, I don't know why people don't do it. Um, and it, you know, it affects also to the, the caching behavior because now you're, you're doing a copy of the, the inner and outer tuple and putting that into some buffer. Like that affects the whole, the whole architecture of the system. All right, so I'm going to go through each of these phases one by one. So in the partition phase, again, the idea is that we want to split the, both the inner and the outer. You have, you have to do both. We want to split them into these partition buffers based on, the, on their join key. And the goal here is that the cost of doing multiple passes over both relations and, and partitioning them, like essentially doing, doing copies of them, the goal is that the cost of doing that will be less than the, the cost of cache misses, um, TLB misses, and, 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 um, yeah, and when we actually do the join in, in, the, in the, the, both, the, I guess, the build phase and the probe phase, right? So sometimes in the literature you'll see this called hybrid hash join, right, or the radix hash join. Right? But it, it essentially seems the main, means the same thing. You're, you're, you're partitioning the data, both the inner and the outer, before you actually do the join. So what we're actually going to put in the buffer of these partitions will depend on what their storage model is. So if it's a row store, NSM, uh, then it's either going to be like the, the entire tuple, which it often is, or this is the subset of the attributes that I need to compute the join or, and, and I need up above in my, in my query plan. Right, this is why most people actually do this. Because right? you don't want to go back and get the, get the rest of the data. For DSM, we can actually just only store just the table, the data we need for the columns to do the join, or just those attributes, and then just the offset of where the rest of the data is, is located. Now this is an example of late materialization, right? Where the idea is that we're delaying actually stitching the tuple back together before we present it off to the to the application. Um, and the benefit of this is that we need to store less data into our hash table. But the penalty is, of course, then you do this lookup afterwards if you need to get more after you do the join. I think in, in some systems they do they do late materialization. Sometimes they do early materialization. So sometimes they copy the entire tuple. Sometimes they just put the the, the data that they need. Right? It really depends on what you think the output of uh, the, or the selectivity of the join operator. So if 100% if of, of my tuples are going to match in my join, then I might as well just stick the whole thing in, in there because then I don't have to pay the penalty of going to look up afterwards. But if only like 1% of the tuples are going to match, then I don't need to pay the penalty of copying things in that I'm never going to need. And then for that remaining 1%, I just do go do my lookup. 
So again, for this one, the as, as far as I know, it's, most systems do, do do one or the other. Again, no one tries to be slick or or, or, or um, you know be adaptive and say, all right, well, you know, for this query I'll do it one way, or for another query I'll do it another way. Everyone just sort of picks one and sticks with it, despite you know despite knowing that there are benefits from doing one or the other based on what the query is and what based on what the data is, right? So again, the main thing to understand about why we're doing this is that in 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 a in memory database, a cache miss is so expensive that's better off paying these extra instructions to do this partitioning. Um, that's you know that's that's the that's the intuition or the motivation. It's not always the case though. So let's talk about how we actually want to do this partitioning. So the two approaches are to do a non-blocking or blocking. Uh, and non-blocking, you basically scan through the, each input relation once. And then they're going to populate this uh, uh, their partitions, and then um, then they'll go back and, and reconcile things later on. You sort of build it out incrementally. But blocking partitioning again, also times sometimes called radix partitioning, is that we or end up scanning the input relations multiple times, and then we only end up materializing the results all at once at the very end. So we can do this bit by bit, but this one is, is it can only like you only get one final output. So in theory, with this one, you could start producing output incrementally, then have another thread start feeding the, taking the data you're feeding out of your operator and start building the hash table. Where in this one, you can't, you can't start building the hash table until the partitioning is actually done. So again, we'll go, go through both of these. So now within non-blocking, there, there's two more approaches, right? So the first is do shared partitions. Uh, where you have a single set of global partitions that all the threads are going to try to write to, and then you basically just protect each partition bucket or, or partition set with a, a simple latch, right? Uh, like uh, in this, an exclusive latch, I acquire it, if I do I write, and then I, I, I release it once I'm done my write. With private partitions, you're trying to do this in a non-blocking way, where you're going to go through and have each thread write to their own private partitions, and then after, after everyone's writing to the partition, then you go back and have another thread or multiple threads consolidate them into a, uh, a single partition. Right? So let's go, let's go through bo both of these. But the main thing about this is like, again, there's no free lunch in this. Right? So either we're going to have to have latches to protect our data structures, as in this case here, or we try to be lock free uh, and don't use latches and have everyone write to their own private workspace. But then we have to pay the penalty of, of doing an extra pass to put it all together. So again, this is like classic CS. There's, like, there's ways to make it be latch-free, but you end up doing more work. And so whether or not this is, which one of these two are better, you know, it depends on the hardware, depends on what the workload looks like. All right, so let's go through the, uh, the, 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 the shared one first. So this is our data table. Uh, and just like in morsels, we're going to split it up into chunks, right? And each, each, you know, we'll have each thread or, or core be assigned to operating on, on some chunk here, right? like a disjoint subset. So let's say now we want to, our join is going to be on this attribute B here. So what's going to happen is we're going to have a hash function for this, for this phase of the partitioning. And we're going to look at each value here in B for every single tuple. And we're going to do this in parallel at each core. And then we're going to take whatever this value is, run it through our hash function, and then mod it by the number of partitions that, that we have. right? And then they're all going to end up writing into these separate partitions, which essentially are just going to be like a chain a chained link list. So a bunch of blocks, and within each block, we can, st we, st we can stick a bunch of data in. So again, everybody's going to scan through in parallel and then write out to these, these, all these different partitions. So that means that if this guy is writing to P1, at the same time this guy is writing to P1, again, we protect that with a latch. Right? Just like that. Take the latch, append it, and we're done. All right, so let's see how to do this in a non-blocking way. Same thing. We're still split up into different chunks. Each thread's going to hash on that chunk and decide where it goes. But the, where they're going to write is local to its core. Right? So each of these guys have their own copies of, of the same partition buckets that I showed in the last slide. Right? And they're the only ones writing into it. So therefore, they don't have to take a latch to protect any of this. Right? So it means, again, I have to set all of this up ahead of time to make, you know, for each, each core, rather than sort of just, you know, jittering a bunch of partitions for everyone to write into. Then, once I know everyone has, has, has processed all their tuples, then I just have either another thread come along and just consolidate it, put it, put it all back together, right? 
right? Sort of like that. Like so you can have one guy be responsible for one, and then one guy be responsible for writing out the partition two. All right. So again, this required me to essentially do, in this case here, two copies of the data, right? Because I copied it once into this partition, and then I copied it again into, into this other partition. Now you should obviously be kind of clever and say, oh, this, this block is full, then I don't need to copy it to me another block, I just include it in the linked list for the final global partition. All right? So again, this is another good example of you know, different materialization strategies, because if I also, like, if I'm just passing around just the offset, then I'm not copying that much data from one, one step to the next, right? If I'm doing late materialization, or if I'm copying the entire tuple as I put into my partitions, then you know, that, that makes that copying more expensive. All right, so let's now look at to do the, the other approach, right? The, the, the radix partitioning. So again, the idea here now is we're gonna scan our relation potentially multiple times to generate uh, more fine-grained partitions, right? The idea is that we want to split these, keep splitting this thing up recursively until all of our partitions can fit into our CPU caches. Now, the spoiler would be the reason why this is not going to work out uh, in practice is because if we have skewed workloads, then you're going to have some partition have to go through multiple t multiple iterations to get everything to fit into uh, CPU caches, whereas other ones maybe only need one pass. All right, so the first pass we're going to do is we're going to scan our relation R, and we're going to compute a histogram that's just going to count the uh, the number of tuples that would hash to a partition for a for a given radix, right? And this this is the same radix we talked about in a radix tree. Just think of it like a, a digit in the actual key, right? And in, in the case of the radix tree, we were looking at bytes, sort of the same thing, right? Think of one you know one one character one position, All right? So now we, again these histograms are going to tell us. How many tuples are going to hash to a given to, to, to at a given red X as some offset? Then we use this histogram to now compute the offsets of where the where the cores are going to write to based on their prefix sum. I'll explain what the prefix sum looks like in, in the next slide. Right? Then now using this this histogram the, the prefix sum that's going to tell us where our each thread is going to end up writing into our partition space, and they don't need to coordinate with each other. So now we know that every thread can write at some offset in this giant list of, of, of tuples or, or, or keys. And I know that nobody else can try to write to the same slot as I am. So again, I'm gonna, I'm, let me walk through all of this. But this is a good example of like com combining sort of a bunch of simple ideas that we sort of already talked about and allowing us to do something more, more, more complex. All right, so the radix, as we already said in the radix tree, is just going to be some digit or position at, uh, at a particular key. So let's say our input key sequence is 89, 12, 23, 08, and 41, 64. So the radix for this position would just be nine, right? And two, three, eight, one, four. So we're only looking at one, again, one digit of this, right? All right, same thing with the next one, eight, eight, one, two, zero, four, six. Now, with the prefix sum, all that is is just a running count of, of, of a sequence of numbers. Right? So say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, these are our input keys. So when we start computing the prefix sum, the first position here, there's no, nothing comes before 1 in our, in our list here. So the, the, the prefix sum is just 1. But now we're going to take the output of, of, of the last prefix sum in our list plus uh, the next key in our, in, our, in our input sequence, add them together, and that's our prefix sum. So in this case here, it's 3. Same thing. 3 plus 3 gives me 6, right? and going forward down like that. So we're going to use this technique to get this prefix on. That's how we're going to figure out where our offset is for each core to write into our list of keys when we do our partitioning. And we're going to partition based on the radix key, or the radix of a, a single digit, at one position, do partitioning, figure out where to write, write into our, our, our total key space, then do it again for the next, next radix position. So let me, let me walk through a whole example of this. All right, so... For this one, for simplicity, again, assuming we've already hashed everything, right? So these are just the hash values of our keys after we've already spit the balance, you know, after we've already gone through and, and hashed everything. So the first step, we want to go through uh, our, our input sequence and create our histogram. So again, we're going to split this up just like we did before in morsels and in the previous approach. So the first core is only going to look at these first four keys. The second one's going to look at the next four keys. So we look at the first radix position here. And then we're going to say, well, what, uh, we're just going to count how many t t 
keys at, or how many keys will master each partition that we're gonna have. So we can take this, this, this value here, mod it by the number of partitions that we have, and that's gonna tell us how many we have, or how many tuples we're gonna write into. So let's say we have two partitions, because we have two cores. So in this case here, for partition zero, we had two entries, one, two. And for partition one, we had one, two entries, one, two. For down here, we had one uh, for position zero, and then three for partition one. So now we compute the prefix sum based on these histograms. So we're just gonna go in order, like starting two, two, one, three, and compute the prefix sum of this, and that's gonna tell us for, for a given partition at a given CPU core, where, sh where should they start writing the keys into? Right, so starting with this one here, right, this one, writes 0, 7 into here because this is at position 0 and we, for this, uh, partition 0 uh, at offset 0 writes into here. This one was at partition 0 uh, at offset, uh, in this case here, 2, 4, 5, so, or end up writing here for partition 0, sorry. Yeah, so this would be 2, uh, 1, 2, 3. So this one would say I have a length of 2, so this one starts at 3. Is that clear? And I do it for the next one and write it there. So now, again, I'm taking, going passing through my data again and just writing out and copying where this thing's actually being partitioned, like this. And I don't need to coordinate for each thread where they're writing into because I've already pre-computed where, where it's safe for them to start appending their keys into this. So the algorithm says you can keep doing this and keep partitioning until these, these partitions fit into your CPU caches. Right? So, they say in the original Intel paper that you could do this essentially two times. So you could do this all over again. Now look at the, at the next rate exposition and do the exact same thing that we, that we did before. But now this is a good example of why this, this becomes problematic because I partitioned it up before. Uh, for this one's looking at maybe at partition one, um, sorry, at partition zero, this CPU only has three things to look at, whereas this one has uh, six things to look at. So now this CPU is going to do three quick things and then be, essentially be, be blocked waiting for this guy to finish, right? So you sort of have this skew problem where everything could end up being at one core and everyone else is going to be idle. So in practice, nobody, as far as I know, at least in the, in the, in the literature, goes beyond doing one pass, right? One, one round of this rate of partitioning, right? Even though in theory you can keep going until you get hit all your digits. Yeah, at some point it's diminishing returns. Right, because I'm passing through the data when I should probably just be joining it. All right. All right, and then same thing. They just rip, rip through it like that. All right, so this is clear. Again, the idea here is we're splitting up to partitions. We can do this in a blocking and a non-blocking way with your shared partitions or global partitions. Uh, till we split up our, our, our both our input, our inner relation, inner relation and outer relation into these smaller chunks so that everything fits in our CPU caches. All right, so now that we have this, uh, whether or not we actually do a partition or not, we enter the, the build phase. So the idea here is that we're going to scan through with multiple threads on our outer relation R, and then for every single tuple, we're going to hash it on our join key, and it has to be the same hash function we used in the partition phase, and the same hashing function we're going to use in the pro phase. This, it has to be all, everything has to be the same. Uh, and then we're going to take, you know, find our hash, or do the hash on our join key, find the, uh, what, what bucket the, 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 the tuple should exist in our, in our hash table and add it to that. And the goal here is that we want our buckets to only be a few cache lines in size. Obviously we have to do alignment as we already talked about. But the idea here is that again, we want to have, uh, we want to be able to write a, our key into a single cache line and not have to do two cache, cache lookups to, or two memory lookups to go get the data we want. So, the thing we're going to care about here is how we're actually going to organize our data structure to store this data as, as we do our build phase. Right? And this is what people colloquially refer to as, as a hash table. What people often think is a hash table as being the actual data structure. A hash table that actually is actually comprised of the, the hash function and the hashing scheme that's used to, to store data into it. And the idea, idea here really is, is the hash function is way we're going to take a large key space all right, of any arbitrary value and map it into a smaller domain that can fit into some region of memory, right? Because we don't want our hash table to be too, you know, to be massive because that's a waste of space. Um, and then the hashing scheme that we're going to use is going to tell us how we handle collisions after we, we've already hashed. After we hash and fi figure out where our data should be stored in our in memory, 
if we have collisions, how do we handle that? So again, we're going to go go through through both of these. And again, it's, it's going to be this trade-off again about you know how fast we can be uh, in our hashing versus our collision rate, and then when we have a collision, do we pay extra instructions on inserts or pay extra instructions on on lookup? And I'm not saying one is better than another. Again, most systems, again, when we ask them, most companies, when we ask them, they just say they just pick one and stick with it. All right, so our hash function. So the, it goes without saying here, but the goal, when we, when we say hash function, we don't really care about anything related to encryption, security, or cryptography, right? It's just about taking keys of arbitrary length and an arbitrary domain and then mapping it into either 32 bits or, or 60, 64 bits. And then we can mod it by the number of, of buckets where we can store stuff. So again, we don't care about SHA-1, SHA-256. We don't care about two-way hashing here. So meaning we don't care about taking the key, hashing it, and then being able to reverse it back and get the original value. We don't care. We just hash it, and we, we want to have it be fast and unique enough that our collision rate is low. So the, the, the two ends of the spectrum for our, how we pick our hash function is we can either be really fast uh, or we, we can have a, uh, a low collision rate, right? And, and these, these are sort of at the two opposite ends of the spectrum. So it's like you can't have the best of both worlds. You sort of have to pick where do you want to be in the middle. So in the case of for, for performance, the easiest hash function you could possibly ever have is no matter what input you give it to the function, you just return the value 1, right? That's amazing fast because it's, 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 you know, it's writing out 1 to a register. It's nothing. The problem is, if every key hashes to one, then your collision rate is going to be huge. And now, when you stick it in your hash table, you're going to have collisions, and therefore, you're essentially going to fall back to a sequential scan to find the data that you need, which is what we wanted to avoid in the first place. On the other end of the spectrum, if you want to have zero collision rate, then you can use what's called a perfect hashing function, which is basically taking every possible unique value for a key you give it, you're guaranteed to have a unique uh, hash hash value, a unique position. Right? And the way you, you can implement this is essentially just having another hash table on the inside. Right? If I know exactly the number of slots that I have, then for every key that I give it, I have a, then another you know, physical mapping to a position that's guaranteed to be unique. So this is more of like a theoretical thing. Nobody, you can't actually do this in practice. So people, you know, the, the goal here is we want to pick something in between that has good performance but a low collision rate. So there's a bunch of different hash functions that uh, people use in, in, for the database system for doing joins. Um, so the, probably the oldest one you could possibly use is CRC32 or CRC64. Um, so the CRC algorithm itself goes back to like 1961, but in 1975 is when the 32-bit version came out. So this is what people actually use in networking to do uh, for, for error detection on packets and things like that. But it's actually essentially the same thing as a hash function. It's taking some arbitrary key of an arbitrary length and producing a you know, semi-random value. So there are actually some systems that, that we ask them, they're actually using CRC32 for, for hashing, right? Uh, the more modern approaches are murmur hash, city hash, and farm hash. Or actually, these probably two are the ones we actually care about. So murmur hash was actually written by this like random dude on the internet. He just like posted his source code on, on, on GitHub or source source. I, I forget the details. Um, and then people sort of picked it up and actually started using it because it had nice properties. Like it, it was fast and it was general purpose. Um, and it had, it had a good collision rate. And then Google took Murmur Hash 2, the second version of it, and then they modified it. Uh, they borrowed some ideas of it, and they came out with something called City Hash. And this was designed to be really fast for, uh, for keys that were less, less than 64 bytes, because that was something specific to Google's uh, the sort of problem they were trying to solve. So rather than being general purpose, they sort of specialized to do well on 64 bytes. Then there's uh, later on, they came out with, with uh, City Hash. I'm sorry, farm hash was a, a variant of city hash, and this was designed to have um, uh, better, better, um, you know, better collision rates um, for the same kind of data set. So the, these two could be interchangeable. This one has this one works better. There's also a um, in Google it's called highway hash, and I think that one's like um, that has protections against like cryptocallic analysis on, on the keys. Again, we don't care about that because we're, we're running inside memory. We're gonna throw away the hash table immediately after we compute the join, so we don't care about this. Then what's actually also interesting is that there's a newer hash function from 2016 out of a researcher in Canada from, named Daniel Lemire um, that is called CL hash. And what's kind of cool about this is that it's based on a different kind of math called carry less multiplication. Um, 
I don't want to pretend that I, I know the details of this, but the my understanding is that um, it it carryless multiplication didn't work well on modern architecture until like the last three or four years when both Intel and AMD added specific instructions to make this work well, and then now you can actually use this for for hashing function, right? And we'll, we'll see what kind of performance we can get. So I think that's kind of cool. This is something. Um, this is something I, I, you know, I, I wonder if people are going to start considering this instead of a set of murmur hash. Because murmur hash is pretty, is pretty common now. All right, so this is a uh, benchmark that uh, it's a benchmark framework I found I found on GitHub a few uh, one or two years ago, and this is actually me modifying it to run uh, some experiments I want to show you. Um, so this is running a it's sort of like a micro benchmark to see how fast they can generate uh, hash functions. So along the x-axis, they're going to vary the size of the key that they're throwing to it, right? That, that, that they're hashing, and then the y-axis is the, the megabytes per second of of the size of the keys that, that you can process. So sort of think of this as like not so many how many keys per second can I process, but like the total amount of data that I'm processing, right? So the first thing you see is that the the CRC32 it actually performs the worst here, and there's these little spikes along the the you know 64-bit lines. Because this is sort of what they expect in um, the way that the, the, the algorithm is implemented to work well in for you know network packets and things like that. Um, like you don't no, like you don't send weird you know one on one packet sizes. Right? It's always sort of byte aligned. Um, the middle guys here, the gray and the red, that's STD hash and murmur hash. Right? This does reasonably well when things are small. Everyone's roughly about the same. Um, but you see nicely that along these spikes of the of the, the, the word alignments. At 3264, 128, 192, right? Of you see the solitude pattern for, for farm hash and city hash. Again, where they're doing really well for keys of this size, and this is sort of like they're using one algorithm when you're less than 64 bytes, but then beyond that, they're switching off to be something different, and that's why you sort of have a longer salt tooth there, right? So again, for our system, at least from the old system in Peloton, I think we used murmur hash um, or murmur hash three. That, that that seems to be pretty common. And for the CRC32 hash, like I found the fastest version I could find on, on GitHub. They, they're doing a bunch of like, you know, bit tricks, uh, little, you know, bit, bit manipulation tricks to make it work well. So this might be the best you can get from CRC32. All right, so let's look actually at CL hash. So when you're less than 64 bytes, CL hash actually doesn't do that great. But then going beyond that, looking at larger key sizes, uh, it does actually really, really well. And it's interesting that you have this, like, these spikes along. Uh, yeah, like the actual yeah, for individual byte sizes, right? And that's why you see to see those jumps like that, right? So again, I, it, there's no there's, clearly you, you don't want to use CRC32. Uh, murmur hash, city hash, uh, farm hash, STD hash. These are all probably like good enough, right? For for doing joins. Um, so I'm not, I'm not claiming that one's clearly better than another, right? As you get longer key sizes, then then. You, know, you, you don't want to use CRC32, but for these guys here, I don't think, I don't think it makes a big, big difference. Right? Actually, I'm not measuring the collision rate here, so that, that, that's another metric we'd have to consider. Um, I probably should do that. I just, I just haven't done that. Another thing to point out, too, also here, is that none of this is taking advantage of SIMD, as far as I know. Like in the case of, for Google's code, like they don't use any SIMD at all because they want this to be portable. So they want to be able to run this on your Android phone or whatever crazy hardware that they have. So this is not using any SIMD whatsoever. I don't. I don't think the other the other guys are either. But SIMD is something you could use to speed this up. I think there's a CRC instruction in in Intel, right? I, I, that doesn't use that though. I, I wonder if that's something we could look at. Anyway, all right, all right. So, right, we we there's a bunch of hash functions we can use. Now we want to talk about what the hashing seems going to be. So there's. Four basic approaches you could do. There's also hopscotch hashing, but uh, we don't need to talk about that. Um, but the basically, again, the, the thing that they're all going to be different on is how they're going to deal with uh, with collisions, right? The best hash function in the world, unless we're using perfect hashing, is still going to have collisions. So the question is, how do we actually deal with that when we have two keys hashed to the same slot in in, in our in our table? What do we actually do? And again, the trade-off is going to be: do we make the reads go faster? Or do we make the writes go faster? So chain hashing is probably what everyone thinks about when they think about a hashing table, right? This is what you get in like Java and C++. Um, it's basically you have a linked list of, of buckets, and that and inside that bucket you're gonna have a slot in your hash table. So you're gonna hash to some 
uh, starting point in, in a chain, and then you're going to traverse that, that linked list until you either find the key that you're looking for, or you find a free slot for you to insert, insert your, your key that you're trying to put into it, right? And then uh, you just, so essentially what happens is after you do the hash, you end up doing a sequential scan to either find the, you know, the slot that you want. And that's going to be the reincurring theme for all of these. Like, uh, in case of linear hashing and, and, and Robinhood hashing, those are all where I have to do sequential scans to find the thing that I'm looking for. In, in cuckoo hashing, it's going to be more random, and we'll see why. All right, so again, really simple. Say I have this, this array here that's going to tell me uh, for each, each position in my sort of hash base where the, there's a pointer to the starting of the, um, of the bucket in my chain, right? And so if I'm looking for a particular key, uh, then I just follow hash here, find my offset, follow the pointer, and then if I'm inserting and there's nothing there, then I just do a, I append a new, a new bucket at the end and extend, extend the chain, right? Again, pretty straightforward. The other sort of, sort of classic approach to doing this is called linear probe hashing. And think of this as just a giant table of slots, like right? a single, single, a single address, a single block of memory, and I'm going to hash to some offset into this, this this list of slots. And then if I when I land in my position where I should be, if nothing's there and I'm doing an insert, then I just insert right there and I'm done. If something is there, then I'm going to do a sequential scan until I find the the the, the stopping point. Of, of when I can insert what, what I want, or, or free slot. If I'm scanning, if I'm doing a lookup, then I land in my position, I check to see whether the thing I'm looking for is at the first slot that I, that I land on. If yes, I'm done. If not, then I dan do that scan until I find what I want. Or I reach a, a empty space when I know, I, I know there's nothing else, or, uh, or I wrap around, and meaning I've seen everything, right? So let's look at an example. All right, so say these are all the keys I want to hash. So the first one I cache is A, and then I hash to this position here. Nobody's there, so I go ahead and store my, my, what I want. So in this case here, I'm going to have to store not only the key that I'm storing, but I also want to store the hash of what I'm storing. Because I want to be able to quickly identify, that, is this the thing that, that I actually want? Or have I gone beyond uh, a bunch of hashes of things that, that should be sort of stored here, but now I'm looking at some other hash value? Right, now I store B, same thing, B has a free position, so it goes there. So now I want to store C, and C hashes to the same spot that A is located in, so I just do a sequential scan until I find the next free slot, which is the next one, and that's where I insert C. Same thing now with D, gets here, C is already there, so I insert there. All right, now in case of E, same thing, I keep going down until I find what I want. And then F goes here and goes like that. So again, now if I'm doing a lookup to find say, E. E hashed here, I say this is not the E that I'm looking for, this is A, jump, and I just keep going down here. And I keep track of what I was looking up for the first case, because if I scan back around and come, come here, I don't want to be stuck in an infinite loop. I need to know when, when I can terminate. So say E was actually not here, and this space was empty, so as soon as I got here and I saw it was empty, then I would know that I'm done. I get my search can terminate. Right? So this seems really simple, because it is, this actually is going to turn out to be the fastest way to do this because it's so simple, All right? There's no tricks about copying things out, right? Obviously, the 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 the, your, the it's sort of equally penalizing inserts and scans because I'm always just scanning through. But based on what the harbor can actually do, the harbor prefetcher, if I'm scanning a lot of things, can actually br start bringing in things into memory as I'm scanning along, assuming I'm going to keep going, going down. So there's actually things that the hardware can actually do to try to, to alleviate the penalty of having to do the scan. So the hardware, though, is not going to be able to minimize the number of uh, comparisons we have to do during that scan. Right? So maybe I don't pay a big penalty for my cache misses because things are already in my caches, but I still have to look and see whether my hash key matches what's, what's in that hash table. So that sort of sucks. Um, the other thing that sort of sucks about this is that we need to have a, uh, to sort of minimize the, or to reduce the amount of collisions we're going to have, I need to make sure I allocate a large enough space so that uh, the likelihood that if I'm inserting something and, it's, and the, the slot is empty is, is, is high. Now we'll see this later on when we talk about the, the 
cost models for query optim optimizers. There'll be this one example in Postgres where the Postgres tries to estimate the size of your hash table to your hash, hash join. You're sort of trying to pick out the minimum size that you need. But the problem is if you get to the point where your collision rate is too high or the hash table is full, they basically have to create a new hash table and then rehash everything to, into the new one. Right? That sucks. Like, that's doing a bunch of extra work uh, because you didn't size your hash table correctly. So that's the big issue with all these sort of hash table schemes is that you want to make sure you pick a hash table that's large enough that your collision rate is low, but you don't want to be too large that you're blowing out your CPU caches or you're just wasting memory. So say we want to reduce the number of wasteful comparisons that we do uh, when we, during our join. What can we do? A larger, or a larger hash. He says what, use a larger hash table? Well, what's the big issue here, right? So this guy here for E, I had a bunch of people, uh, I should be here, but I end up down here. But when you think about it though, so like D, D should have been here, but it ends up here. So D is actually closer to where it should be than E is. E is all the way down here. It's, it's three hops away. What's that? He says swap E and A, yes. So that's what's called Robinhood hashing. The idea of Robinhood hashing is that we're going to steal the slots from, from the rich keys, meaning keys that are closer to where they should be in my hash table, and then give them to the poor keys, right? the keys that are farther away. And the goal here is to hopefully reduce the, um, the variance in how far each key is away from where they, uh, they should be by, again, swapping things around and try to, try to even things out. So this is an old idea. This goes back in the paper is like 1985, or, or here it is, yeah, 1985. Um, and sort of no one paid attention to it. And then it showed up on Hacker News a few years ago, and then a bunch of people thought this was a good idea. Um, and then it turns out it's actually a bad idea because you're going to end up doing you know, do more work and much more copying than, than, than you would have if you just sort of left things alone the way they are in linear probing, right? So what will happen is, for every single key we insert, we had to keep track of how many positions we are from where we should be, but we had a collision. And then we use that when we do an insert and we look at to see, all right, well, I should be here, but you're there. How, many, how far away are you? How far away am I? And if I'm farther away than you are, then I steal your position. And then you have to top out and keep scanning down to figure out where, where you belong. So let's look at an example. So insert the same keys. A goes here, and again, I'm storing the the number jumps from where I should be for my first position along with the original key. So A, when it got inserted, there was nobody else there, so its, it's number of hops is zero, or number of jumps is zero. Same thing with B, B gets inserted at the top, the number of jumps for him is, is zero. So now I insert C. C should go here, but A is there. So at this point, C is zero jumps where it should be, because this is the first place we landed after we did our hash. And so A is also where it should be with, with zero. So at this point, they're two equivalent. We don't, we don't take anything from A. We leave A alone and we go and set, set, go ahead and insert C here. But now we keep track that we're one hop away from where we should be. Now we insert D, same thing. Well, in this case here, D is zero hops where it should be. C is one, so C is greater than, than zero. So C is considered poor, more poor than, than the other one, than D. So D has to go here, and it's one hop away. Now we get to, to E. Again, the very beginning, A is zero hops, E is zero hops, so they're equivalents. So we leave them alone. Now we get here. C is one hop, E is one hop, and we leave, we leave C alone. But now we get here. D is one hop, E is two hops, so E is considered poor, more poor than, than D, so it's allowed to, to shoot it in the head, you know, steal its car, run away, and then it takes, it takes its slot, and then D has to get inserted down here, and then now it's, it's it's two hops away. So now we insert F. F should go here, but D's in here. But, so two is greater than zero. So F can't steal its slot, so it goes down here. All right? So again, the, the, the intuition of this is that we're reducing how far away each, each key is from where they should be. So now if I'm doing that hash lookup on E, whereas before I would have to get down to here, before I can find it under linear probing, but under uh, Robinhood hashing, I only go have to, I only have to go here. So this makes my lookups go faster because I'm reducing the number of hops it, me, it takes for me to get there. But 
my inserts got slower because now I had to, you know, in this case here, I only had to swap two of them, but I could potentially have to swap way more, you know, depending on what's actually in my hash table. And it turns out that copying is, is going to be terrible for cache performance of this thing. All right? So I don't want to name names, but we had a, uh, a speaker come from a, a well-known database company from two years ago. Uh, they talked about how they were using Robin, Robinhood hashing. We asked them why. They said they saw it on Hacker News and thought it was a good idea. Right? But then the paper you guys read shows that it is actually not a, bit, not a good idea. All right. All right. So these are all variants of linear probe hashing. So let's look at, let's look at a different way to deal with collisions. Uh, we are not doing linear probing in the same way, um, called cuckoo hashing. So the idea here is that instead of having one single table space that everyone's trying to insert into, we're going to have multiple tables. And what will happen is each table will be managed by a different hash function. And whenever I want to do an insert, I hash uh, my key with both hash functions. And I look in those two tables, or it could be, could be more than two. I look at those two tables, figure out where I have a free slot, and, and choose the one where I, actually, I can insert. But then if I don't have a free slot, then I pick a random victim to steal from, take its position, and make it move out. And then now when I would do a lookup, my lookup is always going to be an 01 because I'll take my key, I hash it, and I'm guaranteed to find it in either, in either hash table, whatever hash table that I have. Right? So again, let's, let's look at an example. Again, you can have multiple hash tables in, in Cuckoo Hashing. In practice, everyone always uses two. So say I want to insert x. I take x, and I have two hash functions for table one and two. And both of these guys hash to these positions. Both, both slots are free. I flip a coin, and I pick one. In this case here, we pick this one here. Now I want to insert y. Hash, again, I hash it again with both. Say the first hash function actually maps to where x already got inserted. Right? But the second hash function maps to this other slot that's free. So rather than steal x, x's position in the first one, I just go ahead and insert it over here. All right? No problems. But now I'm going to insert z. So z is going to hash to this slot, and it's going to hash to this slot. So I'm going to flip a coin and pick a victim. So let's say that I, I choose that side. But now I know that back before, right? so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and steal its slot. So, but now I've got to put it back over here. So, I'm, so when I, before when I hashed it, it mapped to where x was. So now I've got to go steal it, its, its slot. But then I take, take you know, put eight, Y in its spot, X comes out, I hash it again, and it goes over there. All right? So again, I need to keep track of where I started, because if X then got mapped back where Z was, and Z comes out, and now I see I'm comparing X and Y are in the same positions, then I know I'm stuck in an infinite loop. So there's sort of extra metadata to keep track of as, as you do an insert to make sure that you don't, you're not just taking things out and putting back in infinitely. So again, now when I do a lookup, like say I'm trying to do a lookup on z here, I'm going to hash in both one, with, with both hash functions because I don't know what table it landed in, and I'm guaranteed to either, either be one or the other, right? in this case over here. Right? A key won't exist in, in both hash, hash tables at the same time, and if a key does exist in our, in, our, in our domain of the keys we're keeping track of, I'm guaranteed to see it when I do my lookup in either table. So I don't need to follow a chain of anything when I do my lookup. I'm always guaranteed to get you know, 01 lookup. So what's the penalty of this? Right? Of course, obviously, we're maintaining two different hash tables, right? or more hash tables. But also, too, now our inserts are more expensive, because for one insert, we may end up re, you know, taking out and reinserting the entire key space, which will be slow. So uh, in practice, uh, the math works out that if, with two hash functions, you probably don't need to rebuild the entire hash table. It shows about 50% full. But with heat, three hash functions, three hash tables, you probably don't need to rebuild it until the table is about 90% full. So again, you're paying extra memory costs to have multiple hash functions or hash tables, but you don't have to do the rebuild. Right? If the thing gets full, then you, or if, you, if you're stuck in an infinite loop, then you have to resize it. And you won't have to do that with probability about 50% until it's 50% full or until it's 90% full in either one. So in practice, most people do this, and you, and, you, and you size the hash table large enough so that you don't have to do a complete rebuild. All right, so what do we have at this point? We've done our partitioning. We've, we've split things up. And now we design our hash table. Right, it's com comprised of the hash function and the hashing scheme. So now, again, so now we populated it in the build phase. So now we go into the, the probe phase. 
So now in the pro phase, we're going to go through our H tuple in our inner relation. We're going to hash it on the join key, do our lookup into our, our hash table that we just, that we just constructed in the, in the last slides, check to see whether we have a match. If yes, then we, can, we know we can uh, you know, materialize that, the, the, the join tuple as our output. Right? So if our inputs were partitioned, then we, we're going to assign each thread its own partition. Because then that way they operate on data that's guaranteed to be local to it and, and in the portion of the hash table that's local to it, right? If it's not partitioned, then you essentially have one cursor doing a sequential scan or you break up into morsels and everyone sort of you know, feeds a bunch of data and, and does whatever it is that they want to do, right? So one optimization that what we can do here, we kind of the really only optimization, optimization that I'm aware of that we can do in our pro phase is to do a trick from vector-wise where you put a bloom filter in front of, you build a bloom filter at, during the build phase and you use that before you do your probe in the, in the third phase. So you check the bloom filter to see whether the key you're looking for exists in the hash table with your bloom filter. If yes, then you go do, do the probe. If no, then you just, you stop. All right, so say what happens, so say again, I'm, I'm doing a join on A and B. In the first part, when I do my, my, my build phase, Right, as I'm building my hash table on, on A, I'm also going to construct a bloom filter of all of the keys that I've inserted into my hash table. Then now when I enter the, the, the probe phase, I first check the bloom filter for my key if it doesn't exist in here, because again, the bloom filter can have false positives but not false negatives. So if a key, if a key does not exist in my hash table, it, the bloom filter will guarantee that it does not evaluate to true when I check to see whether it exists. If it doesn't exist, I skip this tuple and go to the next one. If it does exist, then I actually do my probe in my, in my, in my hash table. And again, the trade-off here is that if, if, some, if, if the, the selectivity of my, of, my, of, my, of my join is low, then the cost of actually doing this extra instruction to go check the bloom filter is actually going to be a big win. Right? And I think some, some, in our own research, we've seen about the 2x improvement of your hash join. If everything is going to match, then this is just wasting instructions because I'm going to go check this. It's going to evaluate true. Then I go check that, and of course I'm going to find you know find what I wanted. So, in practice, in the case of vector-wise, I think they always built this, and we'll see a technique from from the Wisconsin Quick Sets system where they actually build bloom filters for everything, and they use that to actually figure out how to reorder stuff, like if, if, based on the selectivity of stuff. But I think this is a good idea, and this we did this in the old system, and we plan on doing this in, in the new system. Right, if, we, if we don't do it already. Okay, so let's now talk about the evaluation of all these different techniques. So okay, I'm not going to go through all the details, details of the table, but there's all the, again, we talked about the new partitioning, no partitioning, private partitioning, radix partitioning. Right, here's how to actually implement all these things, and at what points do you need to synchronize, where you're actually storing data, right, and how many times you have to scan, or, scan over the data. Right, so again, this is, from, this is from this concept paper. We don't need to go this in, in, in details. I just want to look at the results. So for this, now it's an older paper now, but the, uh, I think the results are still valid. And they're running this on hold, older hardware, but that hardware actually still looks like the hardware we have today. It's just we have larger caches and we have more cores. But at high level, it's still a NUMA architecture. So in the odd relation, they're going to do 16 million tuples, 16 bytes each. Um, and then we're going to build a hash table on that. And then the pro phase is 206 million tuples. That's six bytes each. And they're going to have both a skewed and unskewed version of this. And for this, this is a good example where they're not actually materializing the output, meaning they do the join, see that they have a match, and then immediately just throw away the results. They don't, they don't do anything with it. Where in the paper you guys read, they actually copy the tuples together to materialize it as the output, which I, th I think is important to make this realistic. So the, the main takeaway here is that the, they're showing for this particular workload that the, the, the private partitioning is actually the, the, sorry, the radix partitioning actually gets the best performance. Um, I actually, again, these results are old, I, but in general, this, this should always actually perform the best. But this just shows you for these other two approaches here, you're doing a bunch of extra stuff, and you're actually not getting, um, you're not getting a big win. So they're, they're not measuring the number of tuples of processing per second. They're actually measuring the number of cycles for each tuple that you match. So you end up spending fewer cycles if you do radix partitioning, and this is because you're, you're not having cache misses. Right? Where in the partitioning case, you see that all the time is spent on the probe because that's a you're basically doing all these cache misses every time you do a lookup into the hash table here. Right? 
So this, I like this graph because again, it shows the trade off of like, all right, well, if I pay the penalty of partitioning, which the new partitioning approach doesn't have, then that makes the the pro phase go much faster because now everything's split up to, to cash size chunks. But uh, it, it, you can still actually do better for, for no partitioning, even though even though everything doesn't fit. The overhead of the cash misses are 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 negated or not as not as um, not as problematic. If you're executing, if you're, even though you're executing more instructions, I'm butchering that. Sorry. Here we go. More cache misses, uh, but we still get okay performance, and then 24% faster uh, th than getting no partitioning because everything is going to be in your CPU caches. So again, more instructions, but we still do better than slightly better than the other two approaches. And this one here, this is just showing you that when you have skewed workload, then the 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 no partitioning works actually really great. Okay, because now here you're going to have a bunch of threads. They're going to be uh, some small number of threads are going to be looking at a disproportionately size, a larger size of the data in order to do the probe and the build. Whereas this one here is sort of like I don't care where the data, what the data looks like. I just let every core rip through it, right? And that's why this one actually performs the best. All right, so the couple of things that we ignored so far is that um, when we do partitioning is how many partitions we actually should use, and how many passes we want to take over the partitioning phase. So I said the spoiler that was that you actually only want to do maybe one pass with, in, during the Radex partitioning stuff, um, but you could do more. And then how many partitions you actually want to use could depend on how many cores you actually have and what your caches will actually look like. So in a real system, these are actually knobs that the database system can, can, can manipulate on a per query basis. Like I know what my query is going to going to operate on, what tables I'm going to touch, I have a rough estimate what my distribution of my data is going to look like. So therefore, I can tune my, my query plan to set these things based on what's going to happen. It is not something I want to you know, sort of set globally and let everyone actually figure it out. Um, we'll see this one again when we talk about the, the, the query optimizer. Although I'm claiming that, yes, if you knew what things look like, you can make better predictions, it ends up being, everyone always being, ends up being wrong. And so, being able to set this doesn't always help you uh, help you as much as you think it would. So again, here I just want to show that we have uh, either one pass or two pass to radius partitioning, and then in the middle here we have the size of our, of, our, of our partitions. And you see that in, the, in this this black line here is just no partitioning. So you see that if you do one pass and set your partition size to this, then you can beat no partitioning. Um, the scale though for everything else is just it's, that it's all over the map. So for this particular workload, it's kind of hard to get this right. Like this is the sweet spot where you want to be, but you can see that for 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 different sizes of partitions, you know, you can be above or below this line. And this is just basically says you almost never want to do two pass partitioning, right? You always want to do one. All right, the last graph I want to show is the an effects of hyperthreading. So this is a good example where. Uh, the hardware is going to give you more hardware, you know, hardware contexts or program counters through hyperthreading, but we actually don't want to maybe always use them, right? Depending on what join algorithm we're using. So the first portion here, this is running on a single socket. The first portion here is when you have six uh, six threads and, and you have a, uh, a single hardware core available for each thread. Then beyond that is when hyperthreading kicks in, and now you're essentially running two threads for each each core. So if you do if you don't do partitioning then you can take advantage of hyperthreading. If you do partitioning, then hyperthreading actually makes you work, perform worse. Right? Because what's going on here is that the, 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 at this point here, when we do partitioning, we end up being CPU bound in terms of the instructions. Because we're trying to, um, we're not paying the penalty for, for cache misses anymore. So what happens is the, the hyperthreads are just sort of trying to get through the instructions as fast as possible. But there's no stalls because you know waiting things to get from 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 memory into our caches. So therefore, they're stymied on just how fast they can actually uh, you know run the instructions. Where in this case here, the CPU can be a little bit better at multiplexing things because I I'm going to have cache misses, and while one one of my threads is is, is you know, stalled on the cache miss, another thread can actually execute instructions and make forward progress. So that's why we're still able to scale beyond the you know the the, the hardware count here, the hardware thread count. So Hitting the hardware button causes the regression at seven. Would have thought that'd be like a you're now evicting things from the cache because you're trying to stuff 
two cash friendly things in the same cache. So the statement is that when you go from six to seven, and now you're, you have one extra hyper thread, why does it regress? Because, um, and your statement was that you think it regresses because now you have more threads and therefore you have more cache misses? Because now you, instead of one thing that's designed to fit in that core's cache, mm -hmm. you're trying to jam two things that are the size of that cache into one cache. Yeah, I think for this one, I think they resize the, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I thought they resized the, the, the size of the partitions to account for the fact you have more threads, um, but I might be wrong about that. Yeah, so I, yeah, good question. I actually don't know what that dip is. I thought it was, because again, because you have cash, more cache misses, but you're right. If you have more pressure on the cache because you have more threads trying to put stuff in it, then that could be problematic. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I, I need to check the the German the, the the recent paper I had you guys read to see whether they, they still see this effect. I don't I don't remember what the, I don't remember whether they had this experiment or not. Um, but again, the, the the main takeaway from 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 me from all of this is that non partitioning is the way to go, right? Even you know in this case here back for the the skewed workload, right? It was always better, and then this was marginally worse than the the radix partitioning. But to me, you get you get the best of both worlds. You don't have to think about like whether I want to do partitioning or not, I just always do non-partitioning and it, and it works well enough. So this, this is what we did in, in our old system, this is what we're going to do in our new system. And as, as far as I know, no in-memory database actually tries to do both. All right, so, um, so again, the, the, basically reiterating exactly what I just said. So I think the, the simplicity, the, a simple hash join, even though we're going to run things in parallel, is going to outperform any sort of complex partition schemed, you know, with, with shared share partitions or global partitions. All that is extra, extra work. And just, if we just try to go directly and get the data and just do our join with a simple hash table and a simple hash function, then that's, that's going to be the, the best approach. Now, there's going to be a bunch of extra stuff we can try to do to vectorize things in our hash join. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in uh, next week. Or, or yeah, in, in ne next week. But in practice, in you know, the paper you'll read, it'll say, oh yeah, you, clearly you want, you know, here's how to do a, a vectorized hash join. When we actually end up implementing the same kind of stuff here, it doesn't actually help. Because again, it's the same thing. There's, in order to do SIMD or vectorized execution, you have to prepare the data and put it into SIMD registers and copy things out, right? So all of that extra stuff uh, turns out to negate the performance benefits you get from vectorized execution. Whereas if you just said, here's my hash function, just do linear probing and just rip through the data as fast as possible, that turns out to be the best, right? And if, if I remember correctly, I mean, there's sometimes hopscotch or, or, or Robinhood hashing might be better than other cases, but in, in general across the board, the linear probe hashing and you know, murmur hash three is, is, is always gonna be the best. Because again, it's just so simple. Yes? For the hashing algorithms you looked at, like, it seems like a lot of your joins would be on really small, you know, Byte widths, like the eight for a sixty-four bit key of some kind. Is is there a reason for using those you know string capable hashes rather than a simple? Yeah. So so his statement is, do I care about larger keys? Am I ever going to join on larger keys? Uh, so you're almost you're almost never going to join on. Ideally, you're never going to join on strings, because everything is going to be dictionary compressed. Now the issue is going to be. I'm going to have my, my outer table is compressed on one dictionary, and my inner table is going to compress on another dictionary. I could decompress both of them, then do my join, and then, then this matters. Or I could have to decompress the inner, to, inner table and then recompress it to be used the dictionary from my other guy. right? Then again, now you're paying a bunch of instructions. Now I can do my join on integers on smaller keys, but like I paid that penalty to, to decompress and recompress. Like it's, I mean how often in the real world are you using foreign keys, say, at our strings? His question is, how often do you see in the real world people doing, uh, doing join lookups on strings? I don't want to say it's not uncommon, but like people do weird <laughs> time, right? Like you have to be able to support that. Um, right? If someone, it's often time you see people do primary keys on email addresses, so I'm going to join on that. It's not good data design, but people do it, right? Um, and then again, another approach could be like, actually, I, I don't know whether there's good papers on doing joins on uh, compressed data. Because when you think about it, if I have to 
decompress the interrelation and then recompress it, that recompress is sort of another lookup into a, a hash table for the dictionary. You can kind of reuse that to help you maybe do the join. It won't tell you, like, it won't find the thing you're looking for. It'll just tell you whether the key would actually match or not. We talked about a bunch of database companies told us they, they just decompress everything for simplicity. Uh, other systems do, do uh, you know, to, do decompress and recompress. Um, if you're doing foreign key matches uh, and you're using the same dictionary, depending on how you organize the dictionary, the, what the scope is, then you don't you just go directly on, on integer values. Different systems do different things. So I, what I'm trying to, so what I'll say is like, you know, key size is this big. Um, actually, even if, you, if, you, if you're doing 64 bit integers, like compound keys are pretty common too, doing joins on that. So 64 is probably the, 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 the right, the right thing, you, the thing to target. Beyond this, I think I probably would agree with you that they're, that they're rare. I guess my point is, you know, that's a bytes. So like even 64 is really far left. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, but like, so, so like, you know, yeah, you, you, if you do eight, eight byte keys, then you're at 64. That's, that's pretty rare. All right. I can't say who, but a, a major cloud company did tell us they see people with like, Crazy sizes, like like twenty bytes and things like that, um, for like one attribute, for like you know global UI UIDs and things like that. I, yeah, we, we, again we looked at we looked at trying to make hash joins faster in the Peloton system. My student Brashant was doing this, and it was really hard to beat some of the stuff that people already come up with, like from the Ger the German guys. Like you're slicing, you're trying to to like slice off cycles. Nanoseconds. It's hard to beat. It's really hard to beat linear probe hashing. There's like so we we gave up on it. It was good enough. All right. Any other questions? All right. So uh, next class. Okay. The the second lecture on on joins, and now we're going to look at parallel sort merge joins. So what I would teach you is essentially how to do a parallel sort. The merging process is is obviously pretty straightforward because you're sort of walking in lock step lock step. And then this is why we're not doing a class on, uh, on how to do parallel sorting, or you have a class specifically just on sorting, because you get that for free if you know how to do this. Right? So the same algorithm we can use to do order buys, we can use to use for our, uh, our, our parallel sort merge. OK? All right, guys, uh, enjoy your weekend. See you on Monday. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I guzzle cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll run head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the silly cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Pie.